all the doctrines of our Christian faith, perhaps the most exquisite and startling, the one that totally distinguishes it from every other form of belief or religion, is the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. It is completely, mind-blowingly beautiful, even if we can't totally wrap our human minds around it. This idea of God being three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sharing the same substance, but at the same time separate and distinct, is revolutionary. Or perhaps I should say revelationary because only through God revealing this about himself would we even come close to understanding his triune nature. In the lectionary reading from Genesis, we're struck by the use of a plural pronoun in the midst of the creation story. First, we hear that God created the heavens and the earth, and then we hear of the spirit of God hovering over the waters. Then we hear God say, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Perhaps at this time of social distancing, isolation, and bitter division in our society, it's good to reflect on the fact that we are created in the image of a triune God, a God who, by his very nature, is relational. So our true humanity is not captured in the words I and me, but in the words us and we. I've always loved this painting by René Magritte, the Belgian surrealist painter, of a dove silhouetted against a stormy sky, hovering over an empty expanse of water, and yet containing within its own form a radiant blue sky and white fluffy clouds. For me, this is a perfect way to capture the idea of the spirit hovering over the, over the waters of creation. So in Genesis, we have God the Father and the Son mentioned. And when you take a look at the first chapter of the Gospel of John, you learn that the Word of God was also present at the creation, that in fact, the Word was God's creative agent, bringing into being all those things that God the Father had conjured up in his mind. Then we're told that his word is in fact God's one and only Son, who became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul mentions all three persons in his benediction in 2 Corinthians. And Matthew quotes Jesus, instructing his disciples to go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Once again reminding us that followers of Christ are not islands unto themselves. We have been baptized into a trinity and are all called to live our lives in community, in relationship. So God is Trinitarian, three in one. And here you see some of the ways the Trinity has traditionally been depicted. You can tell that none of these artists is really concerned with creating an illusion of real three-dimensional space or coherent perspective. We have no idea where the horizon might be, and our eye is not guided backwards in space to an imaginary vanishing point where parallel lines appear to intersect. You can see an example of how linear perspective works here, creating the illusion of three dimensions with a horizon line and parallel lines or orthogonals that converge at a place called the vanishing point. Here's a schematic of how Leonardo would use these principles in his creation of the Last Supper at the very end of the 15th century with all the parallel lines converging on the central figure of Jesus. You might remember from our discussion last week that the Sienese artist Duccio and the Florentine Giotto were taking the first significant steps toward achieving this goal of creating coherent linear perspective at the beginning of the 14th century, 
but not long after their groundbreaking work, a terrible plague, the Black Death, swept through Europe, and during the years 1346 to 1353, the countries of Europe lost anywhere between 30 to 60 percent of their populations. Estimates range from 75 to 200 million people who lost their lives at this time. Needless to say, the economy of Europe was left in ruins. Trade simply dried up. There were not enough workers left to till the soil to bring in adequate food to feed the population. Craftsmen and builders of any type were very thin on the ground. When an economy craters in this way, the arts are the first things to go. People are just trying to survive from one day to the next. And art seems like an indulgence that society can do without. It took almost 50 years for Italy to recover. But by the 1400s, Florence was back on its feet. The architect, engineer, and artist, Filippo Brunelleschi, had worked out the mathematical principles of linear perspective. And a brilliant follower of his named Masaccio was the first to put them to good use. It happened here in the beautiful basilica of Santa Maria Novella in the heart of Florence. Masaccio was commissioned to create a fresco along the middle of the left side of this church. Scholars seem at a bit of a loss to explain why the Holy Trinity was chosen as the subject for this wall, but I would like to hazard a guess. Masaccio is the very first artist to create a work using perfect linear or mathematical perspective. In other words, to create a work that beautifully created the illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. What more perfect subject than the Holy Trinity to inaugurate the introduction of three dimensions into the world of art? I've selected three videos that will take you inside of Masaccio's achievement and illustrate why it was so important. And as we celebrate Trinity Sunday, bear in mind that Masaccio, the greatest artist of his generation, elected to treat the three-in-one God as the subject for his greatest and most revolutionary work of art. I hope that his exploration of the Trinity will enhance your own appreciation of the union of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and your experience of being part of that beloved community. This is a film about the magic of illusion, how we see, what we see, or what it is we think we see. today are filled with special effects, fantastic images that fool the eye and draw us in. Yet in spite of all the fancy equipment and enormous budgets, these effects are based on principles established more than 500 years ago by the masters of the Renaissance. It was a time of great artistic and scientific discovery, when some extraordinary people like Copernicus and Columbus were changing our understanding of the world, and the artists of the Renaissance were changing how we see that world. It was a time of great artists, great discoveries, and great illusions. It all began in Florence. The city of Florence stands as a monument to the Renaissance, 
This fascinating city is filled with great works of art and architecture created by artists who had developed their skills in Florence. A number of the city's landmarks, including the Dome of Santa Maria del Fiore, were designed by one of the primary innovators in visual perception. Brunelleschi, an architect, was the man who provided a scientific basis for the illusion known as linear perspective. In 1413, Brunelleschi demonstrated the principles of perspective. The key principle is that parallel lines recede in the distance and converge at a single point, the vanishing point. Brunelleschi's theory not only demonstrated that objects in the distance appear smaller, but it also provided the basis for achieving this illusion scientifically. The system for linear perspective seems very simple, yet it took artists centuries of experimentation before it was established. We can see that prior to Brunelleschi's discovery, paintings had a flat look to them. The first painter to fully utilize Brunelleschi's theories of perspective and apply them with astonishing effect was Masaccio. On a wall in a church in Florence, Masaccio created a three-dimensional illusion unlike any the world had ever seen. This extraordinary work, called the Trinity, finished about 1427, was the first known painting to demonstrate true linear perspective. For the people of Masaccio's day, it was as if the artist had dissolved the wall and created a new room. Yet, it was still a painting, just an illusion. Utilizing the power of the computer and digital technology, we can explore this imaginary space. Masaccio used perspective to create a space so consistent that we can actually enter the room. The computer even lets us rotate the room to look at the coffered inside of the vault from directly below. The images of Christ and the other figures become flat without sufficient visual information to create fully three-dimensional forms. Assuming that the coffers are square, the room itself becomes a rectangle, as we can see when we look at it from above. We can also view the room from the side. The black patches represent the parts of the ceiling that are covered by the architectural capitals that Masaccio painted in the foreground. The powerful effect of this illusion, painted by a young artist only in his 20s, is astonishing. Scaffolding erected for restoration of the Trinity provides us with the opportunity to examine the fresco at close range. The cleaning of the painting now completed, conservators fill in missing areas of the fresco with water-soluble paint, which can be removed at any time. Masaccio's original work is never touched. Strong raking lights help to highlight the surface of the plaster, enabling us to explore details not visible from the floor of the church below and revealing Masaccio's technique. His use of perspective and geometry is extraordinary all elements of the architecture grow out of his perspective design. Masaccio constructed the curves of the vaulted ceiling by stretching a length of string from a nail set in the wall and using a stylus to score the arcs into the wet plaster. He also incised lines to determine the perspective scheme for the work. This line, still visible, leads from the vanishing point below.
To create straight lines such as these, Mazacho snapped a tautly stretched string into the wet plaster. You can still see the twisted texture of the string, preserved in the plaster for nearly 600 years. Mazacho made holes to mark the triangular corners of the pyramids painted on the inner surface of the arch. He also used a geometrical instrument to construct the rondels near the top of the composition. Incised lines define their outer rims and the edges of the fluting contained within. Mazacho created a network of large squares as a guide to painting the body of the Virgin. A grid of smaller squares was used for the drawing of her head, a challenge in foreshortening. They can still be seen. Each day he worked on the Trinity, Mazacho would cover a small portion of the wall with wet plaster, only as much as he could finish painting before the plaster dried. Close up, we can see the overlapping borders between these patches, which are called giornate, after the Italian word for day. There are 28 giornate, indicating that it took at least 28 separate days to complete the composition. The donor on the left was painted on day 24. This line indicates the work below, painted on day 25. Restorers have developed a detailed diagram showing the sequence in which the giornate were painted. The missing areas around the edges and the gaps within the composition represent the parts of the original fresco that no longer exist. Using the diagram as a guide and the magic of the computer, we can recreate the order in which Mazacho painted this masterpiece. The Trinity marks the beginning of a visual revolution, a turning point in the history of art. The first painter to fully utilize the power of perspective, Mazzaccio set the standard for others to follow. Linear perspective opened up a new world for the artists of the Renaissance, and they excitedly explored its vast potential.
We're in Santa Maria Novella, an enormous Dominican church in Florence. And we've just come in from a cloistered graveyard. And the first thing we see across this enormous expanse is Masaccio's The Holy Trinity with the Virgin and St. John. Although this painting has a long and complicated history of being moved and restored, the doorway we walked in and the view that we got was likely the view that the public got in the early 15th century when Masaccio painted it. Much of the rest of the church has changed. There may have been an altar in front of this painting. To the right, there would have been an enormous tremezzo, that is, a screen that would have blocked access to the inner sanctum of the church. The subject is the Holy Trinity. According to Catholic doctrine, God is God the Father, the Son, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. This was a fairly standard motif, this elder figure that represents God the Father, the dove representing the Holy Spirit, and Christ on a crucifix. This is known as the throne of mercy. And the idea is that this throne is the throne of judgment, that through Christ, man can be saved. On the side of the Holy Trinity, we see Mary, and she gestures to Christ and God. She acts as an intercessor, an intermediary between us and the divine world, and points to Christ and God. Opposite her stands St. John. All of those divine figures occupy the same space. Outside of that space, we see two kneeling figures, a man on the left, a woman on the right. These are the patrons who commissioned this fresco. And if you look at them closely, you see that they look straight ahead. And slightly up. They're in a position of prayer, of contemplation. Below this, we have a memento mori, that is, a reminder of death. We see a tomb, two columns on either side, and between that, a sarcophagus. But laid on top of that is a skeleton, and in back of it, as if carved into stone, is an inscription. I was as you are, and what I am, you soon will be. This is written in Italian, not in Latin, so not in the language of the church, but in the everyday language of the people of Florence. And it is reminding us that our time on earth is short, and death could come at any time, and we should be preparing for our salvation. And it's a reminder that this painting had multiple audiences. It had the Dominican clergy of this church, but there was a secondary audience, the lay people of Florence, that were allowed into this part of the church. We have to imagine the Dominican friars preaching in front of this image to the citizens of Florence who would come specifically to hear that preaching. And people would come to visit their loved ones in the cemetery just outside in the cloister. They'd walk through the door and they would see this image and make a connection between the death of their loved ones and their own mortality. Although this motif was common, almost anybody looking at this painting in the early 15th century would have recognized the changes that Masaccio has brought to this motif, principally the classicism of the architecture and the naturalism of the figures. In most representations of this, Christ and God are placed in a mandorla, that is a kind of enormous halo that encompassed both figures, and in that way situated them in an otherworldly, heavenly space. But here, Masaccio has given us what looks like ancient Roman architecture, and in fact, Brunelleschi, the great early Renaissance architect, likely helped design the architectural framework that we see here. On either side, we see fluted pilasters, and those have Corinthian or composite capitals. A plaster is really a flattened column. One that's attached to a wall. Above that is an entablature and a cornice with dentils, another ancient Roman motif. The figures of the Trinity are framed by a round arch, which is a classical arch, not a pointed medieval Gothic arch, and that arch is carried by two attached columns with ionic capitals. Everything that we're describing here is taken directly from ancient Greek and Roman architecture. Behind the arch, we see a barrel vault that's defined by a beautiful series of coffers with alternating colors. And at the very back of this space, we can see a secondary arch. So we have a very rational space, a measurable space, a space that makes sense. And it makes sense precisely because 
because Masaccio is using linear perspective. This is one of the earliest uses of linear perspective, rediscovered by Brunelleschi less than a decade before. And Masaccio is using linear perspective to create a convincing illusion that this is not a wall, but in fact the space of a chapel. The linear perspective is made of three components. Most importantly, a vanishing point. And according to Alberti, who had published a book called On Painting, soon after this painting was made, linear perspective works best when the vanishing point is at the eye level of the viewer. And indeed, that is precisely where Masaccio has placed it. It's in the center of the composition, just a few inches above my eye level. From it radiate a series of orthogonals, illusionistic diagonals that appear to recede in space. They are the agent that create the illusion of depth on a flat surface. And then the third piece is the horizon line, defined by that bottom step. And Masaccio exploits chiaroscuro, that movement from light to dark, to create a sense of volume. And so we see the rib cage lifted up. We see the muscles in the abdomen, the muscles in the arms. We sense the pull of Christ's weight from the cross. This interest in naturalistic human anatomy is a key feature of the early Renaissance. And here again is a correspondence with the work of the architect and sculptor Brunelleschi, who produced a wooden crucifix, which is also in Santa Maria Novella, which, like the painted rendering before us, expresses the artist's careful observation of the human body and understands it responding to gravity, a reminder that Christ here is human, has suffered, has died. And both Brunelleschi and Masaccio could look back a century to another great Italian master, Giotto, and his massive crucifixion. Here we see perhaps one of the first artists to begin to think about the representation of the human body using light and shadow to define its forms, to begin to pay attention to the anatomy of the body, to render Christ as physical. One of the most remarkable things to me is God's foot. There we have a perfectly foreshortened foot, and therefore a sense that God is standing. And to me, that epitomizes what the Renaissance is about, this interpretation of divine figures as having all of the qualities that human beings have. And so there's this wonderful conflict between the visionary and the actual. So although the laity couldn't go beyond the tramezzo, Masaccio is giving the public a taste of what's beyond by quoting some works of art in the Strozzi Chapel. In that chapel, above the altar, is an image of God. And then just before the chapel and below, there's a tomb with a fresco of the Lamentation. So there's a correspondence, perhaps even a deliberate quote in Masaccio's painting, in the public part of the church. What we're seeing is this very frontal image of God, of the divine, presenting to us the sacrifice that God has made on our behalf. It's remarkable that this has survived and we get to see it in its original location. 